Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining today's session. My name is Irina, and I'm the event planner for the Redmond Reactor Space. Before we get started, I have a few things to go over. Please take a moment to read our code of conduct. We seek to provide a respectful environment for both our audience as well as our presenters. We encourage engagement in the chat, but please be mindful of your commentary, remain professional and on topic. Useful links will also be shared in the chat. This session is recorded and will be available on demand in 24 to 48 hours. <clears throat> on the Microsoft Reactor YouTube channel. Which brings us to today's session. The session will run approximately one hour with questions throughout, and I'll now turn it over to our speakers for introductions. Awesome, thank you very much. Arr, welcome all ye guests to this show. Arr. Yes, today we are getting all piratical, as you can tell by the rather fancy outfit. Uh, today is the Sea of Nerds. So this series is all about bringing together a range of folks from Microsoft, from interns to graduates to senior leaders, sticking them in a video game and seeing how they fare against skeletons, ghost pirates, digging up treasure and various piratical nonsense. So welcome, welcome uh, for all, all the folks who are watching. This is very much a conversation. So I'm Jim Bennett. I'm a cloud advocate at Microsoft. It's my job to help you learn, grow, upskill, and connect with a whole range of people. And I want to join you in a conversation with some fantastic people from Microsoft. I've got a stack of questions for these folks, but please, please ask your questions. Fill the chat with questions, and we'll take your questions to our guests for each one of these shows. And I want to kick off by introducing our guests. So in no particular order of importance, let's start off by introducing Jennifer Ritzinger. Jennifer, say hello. Introduce yourself. <laughs> Hi, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for having me today, Jim. Looking forward to the conversation. I am not a gamer at all, so this will be um, a very new thing for me if I even successfully get into the game. So we shall see. But I'm happy to be here. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. And Pablo Veramendi. Pablo, introduce yourself. Ahoy, mateys. Uh, Pablo Veramendi. I'm the director of our Outbound Student Programs Imagine Cup, our global student competition, and our Microsoft Learn Student Ambassadors where uh, university students across the globe are sharing their passion for tech on campus awesome. and online. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, we have had a few technical difficulties today. Um, sea of Thieves was going to push out a big update two weeks ago and it got delayed to this morning. Uh, so because of that, we're having a few technical issues. Uh, I'm in the game. Pablo's in the game. Jennifer has been struggling with some game mismatches with Xbox game streaming. Uh, as to so Xbox, as well as playing on your Xbox or on your PC, you can stream games over the internet, which is great, but sometimes it takes a while for the servers to be updated. So Jennifer's going to keep trying to join the game, but we'll still be able to join the conversation. Um, but otherwise, Pablo and I are going to go and be piratical. So, Pablo, should we head to our ship and see where we, we go? We should, but my controller seems to have stopped working. <laughs> ah, see, it's not just me. It is not just you, Jennifer. So, I, uh, you go ahead and I will catch up. I'm going to head to the ship and start. I'll set sail and then we can start chatting. So, oh, Kezia says hello, Jim, Jennifer, and Pablo. Hello, hello. welcome. Thank you for joining Hello. us. Yeah, this is your chance to ask questions of our guests. So please, please fill the chat with your questions. Um, so Pablo, you mentioned you were in charge of our student ambassador and Imagine Cup programs. Uh, but Jennifer, what do you do at Microsoft? I forgot to say what I did, didn't I? You forgot to say what you did, yeah. What do you do at Microsoft? <laughs> Um, well, I am the general manager in developer relations that is focused on community. And so my team um, runs a few different um, strategic programs, including the Microsoft Reactors. Um, the NVP and RD programs are most important and influential partners around the world, who are Microsoft's most valuable, valuable professionals. Um, we run the studios, the developer studio at Microsoft, where we bring you the product group and access to the product group and all of the SMEs who are building the wonderful products. Um, we're focused on education, like Pablo said. We run programs for the next generation of developers, working with students who are in university as they start to adopt the cloud. Um, and then it just kind of goes on and on, but very focused on technical communities and improving our relationships with them and understanding their feedback on our product our programs and our offers so we can improve the experience overall. 
So essentially, it's all about bringing together people who want to learn, want to scale across a wide range of different types and just providing a whole lot of help, whether it's giving offers to students, live streams like this today through the Microsoft Reactor, or how we engage with community. It's all about that skilling. Um, right. I guess, Pablo, you're kind of very much part of that skilling. You're, you're focused on university students as one of those audiences. Um, so, now, Jennifer, you mentioned that this is the next, you talk about next generation of developers. You talk about next generation, you know, your team is next generation experience. What do you, as a question for both of you, what do you define by the next generation of developers? Is it just the university students that Pablo's working on? Or is is it boot camps? Is it kids? What if, What is the next generation? Good question. I'll, 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 I'll take it first and then hand over to Pablo. I mean, really for me, I mean, next generation can be, yes, literally, it can be the next generation. It can be university students. It can be students that are even younger, but it can be an existing developer who is a professional who is just learning new things and upskilling or cross-skilling. Um, they can be a next generation developer too. Um, you know, we are always pushing out technology so quickly um, that there's always something new to learn. It's always like kind of, you know, progressing forward into the next generation. So it doesn't literally have to mean a certain demographic or a certain audience, although we do kind of in our group span the spectrum. We work with startups. We work with students. We work with professional enterprise developers, hobbyists, gamers, et cetera. So um, I feel like very fortunate in our group that we have such a broad swath of folks that we get to work with because that brings in such a diverse mix of feedback, um, which really gives us insights and makes us smarter about what we can offer in terms of um, what customers and, and partners are seeking. So it is a breadth. Um, next generation can mean many different things. Um, but for me, it's kind of everyone and how they are today versus how they are tomorrow. So you can have like an enterprise developer uh, who's just been doing desktop development all their life and they want to branch out into AI, for example. To you, that is the next generation of developers because it's the next generation of an AI developer. Exactly. Well put. Nice, nice. And Pablo, from your perspective, university is kind of the big thing. So it is. Yeah. And, you know, what I see is that, you know, these students are, are doing some incredible things. Um, they may not be aware of what they can do with technology yet. Um, they're discovering it for the first time and seeing how, how easy it is to really engage with AI and, and you know, all these uh, ready to go services on Azure uh, or APIs that they can just plug right into without needing to develop their own AI model or machine learning model. Um, and that really inspires the next generation, wherever that is. In the Imagine Cup, these students are creating world-changing uh, solutions, right, based on the needs they see in their communities. And when other people see that, they get inspired and they say, hey, you know, I, I want to do something like that. Whether it's a student, it could be somebody, a, 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 you know, a toddler, like right, and my kids, they watch the Imagine Cup, but they're inspired with, the, with, the, the, uh, with the, what our students are doing. And really gets them thinking about, hey, what can I do with technology? Uh, and what can I do to lift up my community, lift up myself, get prepared for that uh, for that next stage in, in my journey or my career? And so I really see the, you know, the programs, the Imagine Cup and Microsoft Learner Student Ambassadors as inspiration for that uh, next generation, whoever they are. Um, you know, even adults that, that, that are already in, in working in jobs that see the Imagine Cup might think, oh, wow, if the student can do that, I should be able to do that too, right? And so just see it as an opportunity for students to really uh you know bring what they want to life and inspire others so it's not just inspiring their students it's not just about inspiring across the campus it is literally inspiring the world as you say you get a 20 year old student winning the imagine cup with a piece of technology that's designed to assist people in rehabilitation from injury and as you say that's inspiring to everyone it's not just another student going i could build that but it's as you say it's your it's young kids going wow this is what tech can do um, i remember once i was in my daughter's school showing up talking about some of the accessibility stuff that microsoft has and the kids were like wow you could help my gran who's got parkinson's with this thing so it is it's, inc it's incredibly inspiring for people of a wide range i'm going to, take, going to drop a question from the chat in here from together we open source uh, it's asking questions they say hi do you use open source projects to guide students using real projects? Uh, I'm running a meetup where I help people to start contributing to open source projects of their dreams. Nice, like that. Microsoft has so many amazing open source projects, but I've never seen them advertised to devs. So I guess the question for either of you, as we reach out to the next generation of developers, how are we helping them to contribute to open source? 
don't know which one of you wants to jump on that one first. Well, I would say as, you know, I was, I was thinking as, as Pablo was describing, you know, what his team is about, I was thinking, you know, what we do in developer relations is we're facilitators of innovation. And I think that open source is such an important ingredient in that. And I know that people don't always think of Microsoft and open source, but we're actually, uh, <laughs> we're big proponents of open source. And this is something that we have made, you know, um, tangible uh, steps towards um, in, you know, in the last few years. And, and this is something that we talk about with students a lot because they, they come from a very kind of open source perspective. And so this is very important to us. Pablo, I know you have a lot of examples here of, of students in open source and kind of just understanding, you know, that, that collaboration and to really facilitate that in, innovation. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in, in, uh, in the Magic Cup projects, they're looking uh, at open source and bringing that into the projects that they that they do, they're looking at open source uh, existing things that they can integrate into their projects, and and with our ambassadors as well, they're always looking to collaborate on projects together in open source. Um, and so there's there's just so many opportunities out there. Um, I mean, in terms of advertising, I don't know as, as the company itself. I don't know if we can speak for the entire company on that, but uh, for for students, absolutely, um, it's it, it's part of their DNA. It's it's part of what they do and. Uh, whether it's in a hackathon or on their own or to, in, a, in, a, in a team, we have these uh, quarterly social impact projects that our ambassadors work on. And many of them are, are working on open source with that as well. Um, it's just amazing to see what they can accomplish collaborating, um, what they can uh, add to their resume as, as having contributed to these open source projects um, and where that can bring them in the future. It's really inspiring. Yeah, just to give a shout out to one of our reactor events coming up in a week and a half's time we're running an open source boot camp in the marks of react in redmond and so we're inviting students to come along and the goal of this is to get students from a kind of use github to submit work to i am able to make a contribution to a public open source project um so that's something yeah, we are focusing on in the reactor team so just to kind of put some scales that where I work for actors, I work for for Jennifer's team. Uh, so we are kind of doing that to help upskill, of course, students. Um, so together, we open source comments to say, I use open source to help underrepresented and underprivileged people get to a good job. There's so many other ways to use open source. Um, oh, I'm being I'm being shot at. Pablo, are, are you on board? Uh, I, I'm not. I'm still trying to connect. <laughs> still trying to connect. I'm, looks like I'm going to take on. This I was going to say, Jim, I think I literally what's happening here? I think I literally I'm, missed the boat. I'm currently sailing towards a fortress um, by myself because because of technical difficulties. Oh well. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's a, it, one team, one dream. The whole team's together, leaving me by myself to fight ghost pirates. Yay! <laughs> All right. I would like to say Microsoft is a hugely supportive company, except when it comes to fighting uh, ghost pirates. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, um, I. Drowned Jennifer yesterday, so <laughs> never you know, recovered. It's it's revenge. Oh, I'm gonna put a hole in the boat. Um, hey right. Jim, if I'm in the game, can you add me? Is it, or or because uh, your invitation is no longer working? Yeah, give me a second. I'm just repairing holes in the boat. Yeah, yeah take care of your <laughs> your ship first. Priorities. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to sink everyone. That would be that's very bad practice to sink everyone. Right, let's try inviting you to the game. Um, let's see if we can get. Yeah, it happens to us during the day, right, Jennifer? We're in the middle of something and we have an emergency. You've got to patch the hole. Yeah. <laughs> All the yeah. time. Yeah, this, I'm, I'm sure this is a, uh, um, an allegory for pro production deployments. There you go. <laughs> Patching the hole as you go along. <laughs> um, Jim, tell, is Sea of Thieves one of your favorites? It's, yeah, probably one of the most played games um, that I do. It's. It's cartoonish, which is a bit of fun, so I can play it with my nine-year-old, uh, which oh. is nice. It's made by Rare Games, which is a game studio owned by Microsoft. Uh, so as well as obviously producing enterprise software like Office and Cloud and all that, you know, Azure and all that, we do own a number of game studios. Obviously, we own Xbox. Um, and it's a great game because you can play it with, with your kids, you can play it with other people. Although it's piratical, although you're fighting people, it's done with a sense of fun. Uh, yeah, everything's cartoon style. When you kill people, they just there's no blood, there's no guts. You just uh, they just disappear. Uh, when you die, you just go to the ferry of the damned and you uh, can come back to life. So it is it's a bit of fun. It's a bit of fun. Um, and I first got introduced this by someone I know, Chris Headland, Professor Chris Headland from the, it's currently the University of Staffordshire, and he's a games professor. 
and uh, he was started live streaming this as a way to reach students. So he found that when he ran evening events for his students, that the students may or may not attend. He'll get a certain group that would attend regularly, and others may or may not attend. But when these kids were going home each day, they would watch games on Twitch. And so he jumped on Twitch, started streaming, started chatting to uh, as many people as he could, and he was in basically interviewing developers from Rare, the open source developers, whilst playing Sea of Thieves. So everyone had a bit of bit of something to look at whilst the interview was happening. So it's kind of a, hence what inspired this particular this particular stream. Oh, well, I'm doing terribly here. Pablo's on board. Hey. Hey. <laughs> I'm doing some, right. I'm doing some very bad sailing here. Should we jump on the um? Should we jump over, swim to the fort, and kill some spe kill some ghost pirates? Sure. Let's do this. Um, I don't know how to swim though. I'm just kidding. It's <laughs> uh, so a question from uh, Marcy to say the upcoming open source boot camp is now waitlist. Will the enrollment limit be expanded? Great question. So our upcoming open source boot camp, it's an in-person event in Redmond uh, designed for students. So the reason we waitlisted is so we can, for want of a better word, for, so we can gatekeep. So we want to make sure that the people who sign up and take the spaces are students who will attend in person. So we are waitlisting absolutely everybody. So we can then just make sure you are in the Redmond area so you can physically attend and you are a student. Um, so for example, we've had folks sign up, not really reading the detailed description, signing up from India. And you know, are you gonna be in Redmond? Nope, I live in India then, sorry. We don't wanna allocate a space to you. Um, yeah, we are potentially gonna be looking at running these remotely as well uh, at, at a later date. So yes, if you are in Redmond, and you want to come, just join the wait list and just put down, we ask a question. Uh, oh, we have been oh. now. Hey. Oh, goodness. I was not ready for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was, I was are... intently listening to you, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> Watch out for the ghost pirates. Here's more. Um, so we, yeah, we just ask a question, which university or school do you go to, boot camp, high school, whatever. Um, and then if it's a local one, then yes, we push through the wait list. So Marcy, yep, yeah, if you're local, please, please join the wait list. Um, digging through a few more questions while we fight. Ah, um, Fuel Snable says frame rate not that great. Fuel Snable, great to have you back. Awesome. Um, Fuel Snable has joined a number of my streams. Really good to have you back. Yeah, apologies. StreamYard doesn't seem to do game streaming that fast. Um, we will try and address this for the next streams. Um, ah, I've been attacked. Oh, 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 oh wait. Right, we're just, there's ghosts running around up the top here, Pablo. I'm, um, uh, I'm just catching up to you. So Cassia says, so nice to hear. I'm a boot camp self-taught person who just landed my first job as a cloud engineer. Yes, awesome. Big shout out to, to Kasia for landing the, uh, their first job as a cloud engineer thanks to a boot camp. That is awesome. That's, awesome. That's brilliant, brilliant news. Um, I'm wondering if big companies are interested in people with no CS degrees. Yes. I have a master's of chemistry degree. I, I have I have a BA in journalism. There we I go. have a yeah I have a BA in uh, Spanish and Portuguese. <laughs> so there you go. The answer is yes, yes, yes across the board. Yes. Um, obviously, I think it depends on the role that you're interested in. Um, but I would not let um, whether your 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 official education stop you from applying for a role, um, especially you know with education and learning and skilling being so ubiquitous and so free. And what you can get from YouTube, from Microsoft Learn, um, it's empowering um, how people can learn. It doesn't have to be through an official school or university, um, but it can be too. Um, so yes, um, we take all types. We hire all types at Microsoft, and that's you know a beautiful thing because that represents the world, and we're serving the world because you know we have billions of customers. When we think about you know Office and Xbox and Teams, and we need to be representative of everyone, and not everyone has a college degree. So absolutely is is my answer. I say go for it. I think. What do you yeah, all think? Also I hear this all the time from ambassadors, like, and students in general. Like, you, they they're finding all these free tools for their skills, right? To 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 build their skills, whether it be Microsoft Learn or uh, you know the, the curriculum that we have on GitHub for the Imagine Cup. You know, they, they build those skills that 
that the employers see as relevant, right? Because this is, these are uh, real world skills that they're doing, you know, with with other people. They're they're building teams together, they're building products or the solutions together. Uh, and we have certifications. We have a, cert- a free certification offer for students for uh, Azure fundamentals, for AI fundamentals, all this stuff to get that certification for your resume to, to set you apart from the pack, right? There's so many opportunities. Um, it's and you know if you have the time to do it, then then I, my our, my suggestion is go for it, right? Yeah, I mean, computer science teaches obviously the science of computing. So if you wanted to be a compiler engineer on our C++ compiler team, then there are probably our topics you would learn in your computer science degree that are very relevant. But you can still obviously build up that experience over time. Uh, but for a lot of things, aptitude is important, isn't it? It's it's who you are, it's how you apply. And then what you bring, you know, we talk about diversity and inclusion, and that's not just about, you know, the diff- different races and gender identities, but it's also about different backgrounds. Uh, you know, I mean, across the team we're all on, we've had people from computer science backgrounds or theater backgrounds, and every person brings something different to the table. Um, so yeah, big companies, all the Fang or Manga or whatever they call that that group this day, these days as everyone's being renamed, they hire from everywhere. Oh, Pablo, did you die as well? I certainly did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got started the conversation. Though, I didn't realize it was being chased. <laughs> I will add though that it's it's important though, like if, if you know you can still like get those certifications. Like if you're not getting a full degree, like do get you know do go through and try and get some actual like um, you know badges or you know pedigree that you can put on your resume in addition to building up your github portfolio um you know and like student like pablo said there are free offers out there for students to get certified i think that's important too though because it, it is competitive um and there are certain things that can you know, give you an advantage just to even get you know that first call back kind of thing so i think it's important to demonstrate that on your cv but there's also like getting involved in programs um, you know, there's other ways to get involved in the community and kind of demonstrate how you're learning and what you can offer. Um, but yeah, um, we've had people on our team that never went to college. They went to a boot camp. They dropped out of college. Um, I don't think that the education is, you know, the, the end all be all. So, you know, don't let that stop you. Go for it. And just going back to, I guess, the question, the comments about open source. A good way to build up that portfolio, Jennifer, that you're talking about is contributing to open source. Because a lot of open source projects that are incredibly inclusive, they want people to contribute. And so if you can just have your name on multiple open source projects, that again adds weight to your ability to to, to teamwork, for example. You know, when development is not as a sole person doing a job, you are working in a team to deliver value for your customers. And so if you can work across open source, you're demonstrating that ability to, to do teamwork. That's a great point. And, and I would say, you know, it's, and it's, you know, so much of it today is about collaboration and partnership and how you work with other people. That's like equally as important as, you know, your individual knowledge and what you can get done as an individual. One plus one equals three. And, you know, being able to partner people, work well with others is such an important, you know, um, characteristic that that's something that I really look for, you know, when I'm hiring can- or when I'm interviewing candidates. Awesome. Um, just going to go through a few, a few of these comments. There's a lot. People are obviously enjoying this. Um, oh, together we open source. Obviously knows Kaiser. It says, um, Kaiser is here. I know it looks like on the same YouTube channels. Cool. It's great to see people who know each other. The developers are a very small community. You know, be kind to everyone because if you're not, you get found out pretty quickly. Um, oh, together we open source says, oh, Pablo's a skeleton. Nice. Um, I'm back. I'm back on the on the ship. You're I'm back, back on the ship as a as a skeleton. Oh, interesting. <laughs> um, together we open source says, now I know what Microsoft DevRels do at work. Best job ever. Uh, yes, <laughs> I'm currently being paid to play video games. Um, I don't know how I managed to get this past my boss and my boss's boss, who is Jennifer. Um, <laughs> but yes, but the thing is, the way we reach out to people, the way we inspire people is through a mixture of education and entertainment in some ways if you're entertained you're engaged you're asking questions so yes part of our job is playing video games on a live stream and making a fool of ourselves <laughs> but yes best job ever yeah, um, when, uh, with the ambassadors they asked me to play uh among us 
and I'd never played it before, and they live streamed it the first time I played. And it was it was funny for those of you who haven't played Among Us. It's you know you, it's this game where you have to figure out who's who who's murdering the people on the on the spaceship. And uh, for the first couple of minutes, nobody was murdering me because they they're like, oh, he's the director of the program. We 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 don't want to we don't. Wanna... And then, as soon as the first person did, <laughs> it was no holds barred. And I was yeah, it was it was it was I I did not get very far in that game. <laughs> It was pretty funny, but yeah, again, it's just more about like you know being, building community, building uh, rapport, and having fun, and and then so when you when you're actually doing the work, you you have fun doing it, right? And you know, we're not obviously playing games all day, um, but this is part of uh, you know what we like to do to to encourage people to be part of our communities and be part of uh, you know what it is to to build tech, right? Because tech is fun. Yeah, you know, we 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 build stuff. This is fun. That we have fun in other ways. It's yep, kind of important absolutely. to have, have fun. And also, it's there's something about the fangs, the manga, whatever you want to call it. These big name tech companies that can seem unapproachable, especially to, to folks who aren't new to tech, uh, who you know, haven't come through a traditional tech background. Like, oh, Microsoft, Google, Amazon. You know, they're these big tech companies. The the people who work there must be these amazing unapproachable people um but i mean what we're seeing right now is jennifer's struggling with using xbox live streaming pablo's a skeleton yeah we we're, we're, we're humans yeah, jim is currently dead um, you know we are humans we, when we have fun it shows just the kind of sh the human side of us you know we can be in deep strategy meetings planning out things that affect you know millions of dollars of revenue and jennifer's cat walks across the front of the screen you know it's it's yeah we need this human side i think i think there's there's a lot of elitism perceived elitism in some parts of tech and we need to be more human um, and i will say you learn a lot in experimentation for example i just learned not to to throw your sword at a, a barrel full of uh gunpowder that will get yes. you killed very quickly <laughs> <laughs> and that's probably why I'm a skeleton. But that, that being said, the same applies towards tech, right? You uh, learn to be experimentation. I mean, I'm here because you know, I first started playing video games. I, I have one of the first video games I ever played on floppy here in my uh, on my panel. This old school floppy disk. This game was uh, made in 1987. Older than probably many of the people on the stream. But, you know... I learned through experimentation. I wanted to see how do I how do I put a sound card on my computer? How do I put a bigger uh, the five or three and a half floppy disk on my computer? How do I take my computer apart? Like all that is experimentation. And and you know now there's so much you can experiment with online. There's so many different things that you can explore. Um, as a student, I wish I had <laughs> access to all that uh, when I was when I was young. Um, but I have access now, right? And so I'm I'm. Uh, continually learning, uh, continually experimenting. Um, this, in and of itself, is an experiment that Jim is doing. Having the, having a live stream with G Game of Thieves, you know, it's, and it's and we learn from it. We learn from all the things we do. Um, and you know, I would I would encourage you all to do the same, right? What what is something you're passionate about? What is something you want to learn more about? And don't hesitate to search for it and seek it out and and learn from it. I guess one of the, uh, one of the oh, sorry, Jennifer, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to add on. I totally agree, Pablo. I think the name of the game is Curiosity. Um, yep. And, you know, we have this saying at Microsoft um, that has really been instilled by our current CEO, Satya Nadella, about being um, learn it alls. Who wants to be a know it all? If you know everything, then what are you learning? We want to be learn it alls. We want to be in the space of trying different things, experimenting, piloting. Um, doing things differently, you know, trying to find optimization, more efficiencies, more creativity. Um, and I feel like we're so lucky um, that we have this culture at Microsoft where this is very encouraged because it's understood that that's what leads to innovation. Try, try again. Um, and you're going to have a lot of failures, more failures than you are wins probably. But it's important to um, you know, in, in, internalize the learnings. Um, and then move forward. And I feel like that's progress. And I feel so lucky, you know, I've been at Microsoft for 25 years. I feel so lucky that that's so embedded so deeply in our DNA at this company. I'm just thinking from like a, our audience perspective, you want to experiment, you want to learn it all, you want to know it all, you want to try these things. One thing that's really good is the amount of free stuff you can get. 
so for example, we have our Microsoft for students offer. So if you're a student, you can get $100 of Azure credit, you get 12 months of Azure services, and that renews every year you're a student. So we are literally giving you access to the cloud for free to muck about, to learn, to do what you want to do. Um, that's and that's right. across the board, you know, across yes. all the big tech companies. This stuff is free. We have Microsoft Learn. It's online learning materials. You don't pay for it. It's free. And it has a sandbox. It has. It ha you can actually try things in the lab right there within the learning modules on Learn for don't free. Have to use a, don't have to use any of your credit. And so this is this is incredibly empowering. You know, think about to Pablo's first video game there. To to have that, you had to buy the game. There was a certain cost. But now, because we, these big companies, we make our money on the companies that use our stuff, then we can give you some stuff for free to try. Um, so Pablo, I'm just bringing the ship in because we think we've killed everyone so we can go and rob the treasure. Rob the treasure. I, I brought you a pineapple. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I have it in my hand. I'm not sure what to do with it, so. Uh, you can eat it. Oh, uh, use the same key that you do, same button that you use to um, uh, fight with. You actually eat the pineapple, gives you back some health. So, just going back to some more questions. Uh, Fuel Snable asked an interesting question. Uh, Jennifer, I think you made, I think it was you mentioned self taught developers. Fuel Snable asked, What does self taught mean? That's a great question. So, Pablo, Jennifer, what do you, how do you define a self-taught developer? Somebody that, well, I guess that it... didn't necessarily get formal education, right? That, that has used tools, that um, online or has experimented, has that curiosity um, and wanted to, that, that builds things without formal education, right? Um, you know, there's, there's so many, as we've been talking about, there's so many different things you can do online to learn uh, and, and be, a developer without having that formal education. Um, we even have low code, no code, right? With our power platform where you can, you know, you don't even need to open up a, a development uh, um, a development tool like Visual Studio. You can just go into power platform and create something um, in a, a visual uh, IDE to, 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 to do something great. And so um, yeah, for me, it's somebody who doesn't necessarily have that formal training or have a degree but had that curiosity and, you know, took those steps into to learning more and, and kind of uh, d being self-taught. But that also can be someone who's got a degree. You know, like, like I was saying earlier, yeah. if, you're, if you're an enterprise developer, you've got your degree in computer science from many years ago and you're building wind formats apps, but you decide, no, I want to be an AI developer. You can be self-taught. You can just devote some of your own time to take advantage of all the online resources and become a self-taught AI developer. Exactly. It's kind of like, you know, you hear like the analogy for me is like, you know, a self-taught musician. Well, what does that mean? So that means that they probably were playing around with the instrument a lot themselves, practicing, figuring out what to do, watching free online tutorials, not necessarily going to Juilliard, not necessarily having tutors, um, but taking advantage and also just doing the work, like actually just, you know, starting to practice. I mean, you can go to libraries and get free materials um, and just starting to kind of teach yourself versus having the advantage of maybe having someone else help you. But to your point, Jim, it's not, you know, I mean, someone could be self-taught in a lot of different ways um, and still have formal training or, or education. And that's the thing that, you know, the learning never ends. I mean, we're all as humans, we're works in progress. Hopefully we're always learning, growing, you know, developing. Um, and so it's, you know, it's a lifelong endeavor. And in tech, you kind of have to be, don't you? It's you can learn something, but then five years time, that thing is out of date. So you kind of you, you almost have to be that continuous self talk. Five months time is out of date. Yeah, going back to like you're saying, Satya talks about people as a we have to be a learn it all, not a know it all. You know, growth mindset. These may sound to some people like oh, these are kind of corporate terms, but they're actually fundamentally true. You know, we need to keep learning because otherwise we'll we'll be out of date. Yes, and I also think it empowers us to not be so afraid to try things and fail. I think that, you know, it gives us um, permission um, to be bold and to be creative and to not always know what's going to happen. 
um, there's a little bit of comfort in that. And I think that, was, that I personally, like that's important for me in terms of the culture for the company that I work at. Like I want to be able to keep experimenting and trying different things. Again, for me, it's all about that comes back to innovation. How are we making things better? How are we making things faster? Um, how are things getting better in general for the world? Um, and so that's really important for me. You know, I get, I get asked a lot, um, you know, what keeps you here at the company after so long? And that's, that's one of the, the main ethos that's really important is this drive at Microsoft to keep trying, keep innovating. Even if you fail, you get back up, you try again. And, you know, that's top down from our leadership. And I, I agree with you, Jim. It sounds like a cliche when some, someone says you have a growth mindset, but it's important because it's not here to judge or to be punitive. It's here to, to, to learn and improve and, and deliver a better product at the end of the day to, you know, customers and partners. So I do want to just dig into one of the things you're saying there about, you know, fail. It's okay to fail these things. Um, question for both of you. And I don't know who wants to answer this one first. What are your biggest failures in your career hmm. that you're comfortable talking about? I know it's kind of put you on the spot, but we all we all make we all make mistakes. I once connected a development uh, FX trading system to production due to an accidental change in a shell script that took out a small branch of a major investment bank because they got flooded with a whole of developer trades. Um, and yes, big mistake. And my boss very, very kindly protected me on that one because investment banking can be quite brutal uh, and used that as kind of to beat the stick of we should have no way to ever connect our development environments to production. So we all make mistakes. So question for both of you, what are the biggest mistakes you've made in your career that people, that folks here can learn from? I think for me, it was uh, being complacent uh, before coming to Microsoft, uh, my previous job. Uh, there wasn't really a lot of opportunity for growth, uh, but I was comfortable. Um, and, you know, I wasn't really learning that much. I didn't really feel I was learning that much. I'd, I'd been there for six years. There was no other role for me. I was kind of the top of the IT chain. Um, and, but I was comfortable and I was complacent. You know, I, I in hindsight, I, I think I also didn't have enough... Uh, um, belief in myself. Uh, and so like, you know, applying to a place like Microsoft seemed so uh, out of my league, um, that, you know, I just was more comfortable where I was and it took, uh, an event where I just didn't feel appreciated to, for me to realize like, you know, I got to try something else. Right. And so, um, finally applied for a role at Microsoft and, and that's how I, how I got here. So I think that for me, it was, being complacent for too long and not having enough faith in myself to to think that I would, you know, be able to get a job at Microsoft, Microsoft or a big company like this. Because I mean, that is easy. You find a job that's comfortable. You're happy doing it. It's kind of easy just to sit there. But yep. where tech moves on, sometimes you can sit there and suddenly find that your role doesn't exist anymore because the tech has to change. Yep. And then it becomes even harder to change. So, Jennifer, me, what about you? Oh, so many, so many mistakes. <laughs> So many, small, medium, and large. Um, but one one story that sticks out for me, and really the essence of the learning was: you got to have a plan B. You got to have a contingency plan. And what happened was, um, we were having an event, and our CEO Satya Nadella was going to speak at the event and be, you know, the keynote on stage. We had another executive, Microsoft executive, that was um, you know, speaking before him and introducing him. And um, the the vice president was on stage and doing his bit. And, you know, he was getting ready to introduce Satya. <laughs> Satya was not in the building yet. He had not arrived. Um, and he was, he was stuck in traffic and he was still far away. And I had no way to communicate with the executive that was on stage. But the thing is, is that um, we knew that Satya was coming from another engagement. We knew that it was going to be tight. And oh, by the way, here's my cat that Jim was speaking of. Um, <laughs> and that, that vice president had asked me before things started, he said, what if Satya doesn't get here on time? Then what? And I dismissed it. And I said, no, that's not going to happen. I talked to his chief of staff. They're going to leave at exactly this time. The three minute car ride. He'll be here. So I did not do the plan B. I did not do the contingency plan. And my leader had asked, what happens if? 
And so that has always stuck with me. Um, and yes, we had to do the whole thing, like in the middle of it, where he introduces Satya. I had to kind of stand up in a room full of hundreds and say, you know, he's not here yet. It was all very embarrassing for everyone. Um, but that was my own fault because I was asked and I didn't have a backup plan. And so the, the lesson there for me was preparation. Um, things do go wrong and you should just expect it. And you should have a plan A, a plan B and a plan C. You should have contingency plans up the wazoo, like things do go wrong. Um, and so if you don't think through that, then you're going to be in the middle of a crisis and you're probably going to not have your best energy and thinking at on. But if you had done all this planning in advance when things were calm, then you would, you know, have a plan A, plan B, plan C. And, you know, and they do this like in certain, you know, careers and professions that are very, you know, emergency driven. Um, they're doing drills all the time um, in case of emergency. And, you know, we should too in, in certain situations. So that has, that's a learning that has always stuck with me um, that I will never forget. Well, you got, you can't, you can't, we're not gonna let you off that Jim. You got to tell us. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, just, he's a very busy person. Um, but yeah, just in terms of like building software, software goes wrong. Right. You know, what's your plan B when your website's down? What's your plan? If you need your website up to sell tickets to something, what's your plan B? So it's Absolutely. hugely important. Okay, no, th thank you for sharing that. I know it's, it's often hard to say we made mistakes. That's a, it's usually a very hard thing to do. Uh, people don't like to admit when they, they, make, they make mistakes. So thank you for, for sharing those. Absolutely. Uh, some more questions. Uh, Few people saying hello. Oh, one of the things, actually, sorry, I just remember something I wanted okay. to mention earlier. That one of the things that um, that's very important for us is what we learn from our community, right? What we learn from uh, from you, from the students that are out there, from those next gen uh, next generation experiences. Like we learn so much from you. What you tell us, what you say you want, what what you're looking for, and that's so important. I mean, you know, it's it, they always say, "Oh, we're so inspired by this, these programs we have for students," and it's really. For me, it's the students that inspire us, that inspire me, um, and so we're we're constantly learning from from our communities out there on what they need, what they're looking for, um, what we need to change, uh, whether it be in our programs or as a company. Um, so your feedback is so important to us, um, and so important to what we drive um, in terms of the the products that we bring out. I guess that's kind of an interesting point, actually, because a lot of times you see like surveys. You know, what are your thoughts on this? Rate this. Why do, you know, can we ca capture telemetry on this? And a lot of people think, oh, this is invading my privacy. But really, it's not so much. You know, we don't care about you as, as a person in terms of your privacy, in terms of like, trying to steal your information. What we want to know is, are we doing the right thing? And that's what a lot of these things are all about. Like you're saying with the programs, Pablo, we want to make sure we're building the, the, the experiences that you need. And to do that, we need to gather data. We need to ask you those questions. Absolutely. Cool. So, yeah, Lohonlo says, why tea? Not entirely sure. Ooh. Not sure what that means. Please explain. That's probably a, a um, probably cool expression that old people like me don't understand. <laughs> Um, Kasia says, Microsoft Learn is great, Pablo. I used to work as a radiographer with a healthcare degree, so very different. But I feel like there are lots of transferable skills like communication. And that's Absolutely. that's true, isn't it? Communication, would you agree, is probably the most important skill that developers Absolutely. need to have? Or one of? Oh, yeah. yeah. Definitely one of them, yeah. Yeah, it's probably like in my top three. And again, remember, I'm a journalism major. So, um, you know, journalism is communication and being clear and concise and being able to convey information factually. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I think communication is so important. I mean, you're dealing with so many different people um, and is everyone on the same page? And, you know, it's easy for the three of us to be on the same page. Try scaling that to 300, 3,000, 30,000, 150,000 employees at Microsoft. Are we all on the same page? Do we all understand our basic goals? It all comes down to communication. Um, I think it's so, so, so important. Of course, you know, having like the, the what we call the hard skills, the, the technical skills. If you're an engineer, if you're a coder, if you're a programmer, that's important too. But also, what are you building? Are you able to explain what you're building? Are you able to explain the value proposition? I think about startups and founders who are pitching to investors. 
um, you know, they're communicating their idea, which is really kind of, you know, painting the future, especially if you're a startup, because it may not exist yet. Can you communicate that? Can you storytell? Can you compel people to give you money? Um, so important, so vital to everything that we do. So you, you actually, I, I know you were doing, I, I don't know if you still are, but you're doing communications for Charlotte Yarconi, the president of Commerce and Ecosystems. I do. Um, I help her out on that. Yeah. Taking advantage of your communication skills, like you say, journalism major. So you've got a lot of those communication skills that help. Um, can we dig into Charlotte a little bit? Because if Charlotte is one of those people who's on a meteoric rise at Microsoft. Huge respect for her. Um, had the pleasure of uh, meeting with her, working with her on numerous occasions. Um, but and this is someone who feels like almost every six months, another email comes around saying Charlotte's been promoted. So what, as, as kind of, in terms of thinking about our audience, if they were looking for that kind of rise in a company like Microsoft, uh, as kind of somebody who's observed Charlotte on her rise, what would you say are the kind of the traits, the characteristics, the, the things that would make somebody else have that kind of opportunity to rise through a big company? Yeah, I've had the pleasure of working with Charlotte um, for over five years now, and she's one of my favorite leaders that I've ever had um, anywhere, um, hands down. And so uh, for me, what I really appreciate about Charlotte is, um, and why I think she's been so successful is, one is she's a great leader. Um, she is a people leader. You know, she has a very large organization, thousands of people, and she's able to inspire and motivate um, and communicate what her goals and objectives are. And I think she's able to get a lot of people on board and rowing in the same direction. She's a great, she's very inspirational to me. She's obviously very smart um, and understands, you know, a former developer and engineer herself. She really understands what we're building here and what we're doing, but she's also able to translate that into understanding customer problems um, and how we can help. Um, and then I would also just, the last thing I would say is that she has an incredible bias for action. Um, Charlotte is a person that is a driver. She gets things done. Um, she's able to galvanize a lot of people and move things forward. Um, and it's very impressive how she does that. Um, I really enjoy uh, being in her organization. So again, it comes down to communication. Like you say, she communicates the vision with people and can inspire them to do it through, through good communication. Um, and then just that honesty and integrity. You, you know, when she says something, it comes from a place of, of honesty. Yes. Um, I mean, I, yes. I'm, I must admit, I've, once we were, I was at uh, a dinner with her and a bunch of other people from DevRel, and she was talking about a situation where an organization we were working with wasn't doing the best things and how we, ha we, we were trying as a company to, to help them fix that, help them do the right things for the community and how much of a struggle it was. And actually seeing the genuine emotion on her face um, as she was thanking one of, one of my former colleagues for the work to try and steer a com steer a, a conference essentially in the right direction uh, it's kind of humbling to see it's again it's that humanizing is yes she's this great leader we see yeah, we see what she does but she's a human just, just just like one of us who's found kind of found kind of her niche um so yeah communicate again communication very very important um some more stuff coming through the chat saying there's nothing better than trekking than trekking somebody with no degree you just contributed to open source. Now you're a real contributor. Yes, don't have a degree. You, ha you work through, through open source. You make a contribution. Uh, that's a fantastic thing. And uh, together, open source continues to say, as long as a person is genuinely interested in helping community, no degree is needed. And that's kind of the important thing. It's if you're involved in a community, it has to be genuine. It has to be authentic. Um, and I, I guess that, Jennifer, that, uh, Pablo, that comes across what we do. The work we do with... The MVP communities, the Microsoft Most Valuable Professionals, the Microsoft Regional Directors, the student community. It has to be genuine. Yeah, you know, we don't. I like to think we work for them, not Microsoft. It's all about helping them upskill, giving them the skills they need, not trying to sell Microsoft stuff to them. Would you agree that's kind of the angle you take? Absolutely. Yeah, it's all about providing them a platform to achieve what they want to achieve. Uh, I mean, it kind of goes back to our mission. I always say that. You know, both uh, the Magic Cup and uh, the Student Ambassadors, uh, you know, are really our mission in action, right? Empowering others to achieve more. Um, and whether it be the students within the competition or within the community or how they empower their own communities uh, their, through their peers or, or the kind of sharing uh, what they do um, with tech, uh, I think it's, yeah, it's so important. And it's not about, you know, telling them what to do. Actually, like I said before, it's about them helping us understand what they want, right? And and helping us bring that uh, to life for them. 
Yeah, in our I would say that in our ecosystems and community work, the the the, the great mantra that I love is we ask the question, how can we help? Um, you know, and we are here to advocate both on behalf of our communities and on behalf of Microsoft. Um, you know, we're really we're helping to you know facilitate product truth, to improve content offerings, program offerings, to share that feedback with the product teams, etc. Um, you know, it is a, whoever said it earlier. You know, we we have great jobs. Like you know, we are here to help the community from a very authentic position. Um, and that's what's so important too, I think, for cloud advocates um, is believing in in what they're talking about. Um, you know, they're not here to hawk technology or software or services they don't believe in or they don't believe are the very best um, use of what you're, you know, for your job and what you're trying to get done. They actually believe this is great tech and great software, and they're very genuine and sincere and authentic about that. So I think that shows they're not. I think it, you know, people can see right through that and you know people are making big decisions about platform adoption and they want to understand you know what you know what people are really you know what they're getting into and advocates are so great about you know kind of advocating to and on behalf of that is that is the role of the, of the cloud advocates yes yeah, so best job in the world because we get a chance to speak as engineers and influence without having to sell you know, we don't sell things we're not measured on how much money we make because we don't measure that. We measure, we're, we're measured on what good we can do for our communities. That's right. And sometimes that could be actually going to our product teams and saying, no, engineers not going to like this. We've got to go back and rethink this, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of a privileged position for us, for us to be in. Mm -hmm. um, right, so Pablo, we are to just quickly returned to an island because we've only got about 10 minutes left. If we want to grab these chests, we can go and, we can go and sell them. Sweet. So, so who's winning? Um, sorry, somebody <laughs> winning? No, no, we, we're working together. We are a oh, see, collaboration, partnership. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, so every time we sell something, the money gets shared, which is pretty cool. Um, so, Pablo, you mentioned the Imagine Cup. I do want to kind of dig into that a little bit. So do you want to just explain for anyone watching who hasn't come across the Imagine Cup what it is and then talk about some of the successes we've had? Yeah, absolutely. So the Imagine Cup is our global student developer competition. This is now the 21st year that we've had the Imagine Cup at Microsoft, which is just incredible that we've had this opportunity for students for, for so long. Um, and it's all about uh, taking an idea you have and bringing it to life with the team uh, using Azure, some Azure component as part of your project. Um, but it's for university students. So you have to be 16 or older and enrolled at uh, educational institution. We have had some high school students uh, compete in the world finals, which is pretty awesome to see. Um, but it's really about forming a team uh, bringing your idea to life uh, and then bringing it to a global stage. Uh, we have uh, competitions across the globe. Uh, some countries like uh, China and Pakistan have their own competitions. And some we have regional competitions where you're competing across a bunch of different countries. Uh, but that all ladders up to a world finals uh, where we select the top uh, three teams and then come to a world championship where they compete for $100,000 mentorship with Satya Nadella and uh, you know now we're planning on giving them uh, more of a startup uh, journey as part of that um, uh, moving forward. So it's really exciting. Uh, it's an incredible opportunity for students to build soft skills um, that they may not uh, be developing at, in, at the university. Um, also to, to be part of a team and to do something great. Um, it's just, you know, it's incredible. As I mentioned before, I'm so inspired by what these students what, what, with what these students do um, and hear all the time from executives at Microsoft and you know, for myself, everybody on this call, I'm sure on the stream, you know, we were definitely not doing that when we were their age. And so it's just inspiring to see that that's what students want to spend their time on um, and making a difference. Um, and we've had some incredible uh, su uh, successes with teams within Microsoft. We had a team uh, in 2017 that built uh, and using HoloLens, a uh, augmented reality picker for a warehouse. So if you're a warehouse worker, you put on the HoloLens, it would show you the quickest path to the item that you need to pick. Um, and so you can be more, ha have more efficiency within the warehouse. Um, and they ended up be becoming a startup and you can go get their product now. They're called Ox um, Technologies. And it's just amazing to see they got 3 million in, in seed funding. Um, and now are an actual startup uh, uh, with, with their product. We had a smart arm, which is a, a team from Canada that created a prosthetic arm using uh, cognitive services, uh, Azure Cognitive Services. 
with a camera in the in, in the in the hand, which is all 3D printed, that would see the object and then uh, determine the grip, uh, which which fingers needed to move in the hand and uh, for the right grip to pick that object object up. And so typically, uh, a prosthetic, uh, an active prosthetic like that would cost in the tens of thousands of dollars. Um, and the one they created with commodity hardware and a 3D printed uh, arm was, I think they said like 200 some dollars. Um, and so they've uh, continued on with their project. They've gotten some funding as well. Um, and they're bringing that to life. And just if you think about the amount of uh, folks that that can impact and, and have a huge difference in their lives, uh, it's just incredibly inspiring. Um, this, this past year, the team, uh, for our 20th anniversary, the team that won created um, essentially an exoskeleton hand that used a sensor in your other hand um, to work on uh, recovery from if you were in an accident, you had a stroke and you lost the, the, the your movement of your, of your hand. It would uh, allow you to recover that with these movements. They created this whole exoskeleton, the sensor hand, uh, glove. And the whole um, product around it, uh, the, the phone app and the back end that connects to the doctor so that they can essentially help people regain uh, movement of their hand with 30% faster than normal treatments and also from the comfort of your home. You don't have to go to a hospital with very expensive equipment. They can send this home with you. And it's just, again, like blown away that these students, and they, they were across countries, the one is from Nepal, another one's from Germany, two of them are from Saudi Arabia. So, you know, they, they came together, they met a hackathon, a global hackathon, and came together and brought this to life. And it's just, it's just so amazing what they do. And you know, obviously, we are huge fans of all of our Magic Cup competitors. Uh, but the one thing I want to note, it's not just the ones that move on to the World Championship or go to the World Finals. Anybody, if you, if you participate, and you actually just come together as a team and create something, you've taken a huge step forward uh you, you've done something you can put on your resume uh you've done something that that has helped you grow and learn and that in and of itself makes makes all of them a winner right so in in my perspective and i know jennifer said this before anybody who submits to the imagine cup is a winner because they've they've taken that step uh and and formed a team and brought a product to life so kind of whatever you whatever happens you can at least you're gonna have fun you're gonna build something cool and you're going to get to work with your friends or meet new people. And then if you, your idea can then go on to form a startup, you don't even need to win to do that. If your idea is good enough, you could form a startup out of it. Even if you don't win, it's still a good opportunity to. Um, yeah, to we recently away. launched a, a Founders Hub, um, which is a part of our startup team here at Microsoft. And anybody on this call can go to Founders Hub and and apply if you have an idea. Um, you don't have to have, you have to be like, you know, in stage three or whatever, have, you know, millions of dollars of funding to be part of a founder club. It's something that you can go to today uh, if you have an idea and apply and get some support from, from us as a company to bring that idea to light. So i um, really excited to make that a, a deeper part of Imagine Cup. Um, but again, like there's just so much opportunity out there for you. Um, you just have to know where to look. And that's what we're here to do, right? And Deborah, we're here to help you, help guide you to those opportunities, help show you what's available, um, whether it be through a magical competition, through the student, uh, Learn Student Ambassadors in their communities, through our MVP program. Uh, we're all here to help guide you to, to, to find those things um, that can take you to that next level. Awesome, awesome. Now we've got like two minutes left. So I just wanna give both of you a chance to do some closing words for the audience who are watching. What's your your one piece of advice? <laughs> well, um, I'll say thank you for joining us today. Really appreciate it. But my advice is be bold. Be bold. Go for it. Uh, believe in yourself. Um, you probably don't have a whole lot to lose. Go for more things than you typically would. Push yourself outside your comfort zone. Um, believe in yourself and have confidence and be bold. Absolutely. Awesome. Uh, I have a piece of advice. I didn't realize that I would get uh, seasick playing this game while trying to look at two screens at the same time. So maybe some drama me before uh, online stream of Sea of Thieves. <laughs> I've never gotten like dizzy playing a video game before. I think I was just trying to look at too many screens at once or something. But anyway, um, my advice to uh, those folks out there looking for that next step in your career is, you know, when you are ready to apply for a job, look for something you're passionate about, but make sure that your resume is actually 
tailored for that job. You know, students often create one resume and just blanket it to as many uh, companies as possible. I was recently hiring, I recently hired two people to, to my team, which I'm very excited about. And, you know, the big differentiators were the ones where I, where I, I could tell that they want this resume was for that specific job. Um, you know, it, it, it's an extra effort, yes. Um, but if it's something you're passionate about, then really focus that effort, make sure that it shows um, because hiring managers are looking for that. If it just looks like a resume that they send out to everybody, you know, it's, it's not like, what, how does that show that they're passionate about Microsoft or passionate about the specific role? Um, and so that's something that I'm always looking for when I'm hiring and something that I recommend uh, for the students out there that are t ready to take that next step. Um, you know, make sure that you, you, you tailor your resume or cover letter um, to the job that you're applying for because it can make a huge difference. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody who joined the stream, who watched us muck about on boats, those of us who could get in and got to enjoy some uh, tech problems, you know, see how great folks at Microsoft can be really good at pirac piracy or not so good at dealing with tech problems. So thank you for joining. Jennifer, Pablo, thank, thank you very you. much for giving this time to, Thanks, to spend for with everybody. So thank you. Thank you to our speakers and thanks everyone. If you have any feedback, we'd love to hear what you have to say. On the screen, I have our survey for the specific event. It's our the event code is 16695. And if you enjoyed today's session, Jim will be back next Thursday. Um, link can be found on the screen or in the chat. Thank you everyone. Until next time. Awesome. Thanks everyone. Goodbye. Thanks everybody.